So, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for having me here. And so, yes. <laughs> no problem. So, as I was saying, <laughs> I would like to thank the organizers for having me here. So, what I would uh, uh, tell you about in the uh, next half an hour is a recent work uh, of ours that ap appeared here and would uh, uh, soon be on, on PRX um, about, uh, say, using uh, ultra-cold atoms not, not, uh, not much as a, as a quantum simulator, but like rather as a way of creating states of matter or exploring states of matter that might be hardly accessible with uh, uh, real materials. And that's actually another conjugation of the whole idea of quantum simulation. So the one of bringing, say, ideal models into reality. Um, so, yeah, so the underlying, uh, the underlying motivation is that uh, uh, topological phases of matter are at the focus of, of uh, uh, the interest in the last uh, decade at least, if not more, both for uh, academic and practical interest. And when I mean practical interest is that there are people uh, studying uh, how to exploit spin currents uh, or other kind of topological excitations for the next generation of memories, even if they are not quantum memories. Um, so, but uh, say, uh, I hope you had some, some kind of introduction about that last week, but uh, we will explore what we need uh, in the beginning of the talk. So, and there are two open issues in, in this field. One is how to convert, say, paradigmatic models that are like very neat uh, and on the blackboard give you uh, clear topological signatures into real materials. And some, some key names are written here, and one of them was mentioned yesterday about the uh, Harper of Stetter model, so this uh, square lattice with fluxes. Uh, so how to convert, or what is the relation between the paradigm model and the real materials, uh, is something that is a burning question around. So there are uh, studies uh, showing that some, some compounds that are called iridates uh, might be an incarnation of the kitaev onikon model uh, and so on. But of course, uh, they are not as tunable as a quantum uh, uh, platform based on cold atoms could be. Uh, on the other side, the role of interaction is often neglected in, in real materials, uh, but, um, but it might lead to new correlation effect or to new phases of matter. So in order to tackle these this two kind of questions, so my, my, my plan or my, say my interest is to do that by um, uh, using a combination of uh, synthetic quantum matter, so for example, ultra-cold atoms, so the flexibility that you have in uh, designing the Hamiltonian, tuning the interactions, uh, putting gauge fields, and so on. You have seen all of that uh, last week introduced by Fabrice, I guess. Uh, and a combination of that with, uh, say, a quantum information twist uh, in the approach, so numerics based on, on, on quantum information, so namely tensor network algorithms. And as far as I know, there was also introduction by Norbert about that. So, so let's get started. So let, uh, let's get uh, directly on the model and we will learn the concepts along the way. So uh, the model I want to, to consider is a so-called Kreutz ladder. So you can look at it as uh, two internal degrees of freedom of some atom sitting on a, on a side of an optical lattice. So horizontally it's, it's uh, uh, the site in the optical lattice, vertically it's the internal degree of freedom. You can think about an hyperfine state. Uh, and then you want to have uh, um, two ingredients at, at first. So you want to have uh, a spin-dependent complex tunneling, which is, uh, say, tunneling with an amplitude plus IT in one direction for the, for the upper leg and minus IT on the other leg. Plus you want to have uh, a real spin-flipping tunneling between the neighboring sides. And 
if you sit down and, and do the Fourier transform of that, you will soon realize that, that this is a, a model that describes two flat bands. I mean, two because the, the unit cell has two uh, sides, and they are flat in the case the two intensities are equal to each other. Okay? And a way to see that is actually uh, to look indeed in the Fourier transform and see that you can write the Hamiltonian as a pseudo-magnetic field times the um, uh, Pauli matrices, the set of Pauli matrices, and the pseudo-magnetic field has the same amplitude everywhere, and it's rotating once around the origin. And say the same amplitude tells us that the bands are flat, because the energy is essentially the distance from the origin, and the fact that it's uh, wrapping around or winding around is telling us that the, uh, that the bands have also a topological character. So that's, that's all what we need to, to know about topology here. Um, now, well, if you are wondering whether this is at all possible to start with in, in cold atoms, there have been experiments measuring this, this Zach phase uh, in uh, via Ramsey interferometry. So now what uh, I want to do still at the single particle level is to add uh, Zeeman splitting between the two, the two letters. And if you do that, you will realize that uh, you bend the, the, the bends, sorry for the twist, uh, and they will touch at some point when the intensity of the Zeeman splitting is equal to the bandwidth. So, and they will touch and they will form an undoubled Dirac point. And that's actually the original motivation why Kreutz introduced the model in order to avoid fermion doubling in high energy lattice gauge theory simulations. Um, okay, that's still, uh, so you can see it also in this picture of, of the circle of the pseudomagnetic field, you will see that this circle is moving away from the origin and at some point is barely touching the origin, and this point in which it's barely touching the origin corresponds to the Dirac point. And if you go farther with the detuning, you will have the circle that is not anymore topologically equivalent to the one before. And so you will reopen a gap and get bands that are not topological. But that's not well, well understood. It's uh, all single particle physics. And for the ones that are interested in details, uh, I only stress that this particular incarnation of the model has only a chiral symmetry, so it falls into, into the class A3 for the ones that, that are uh, experts on topological insulator classification. Um, so there is yet another way before going to, to many body physics, so to, to interactions and to actually the interesting part. Uh, so let's, let's have a look at how can we understand these, these flat bands in another language. And uh, these flat bands can be understood in terms of uh, a basis of localized states, which are called Aranov von cages, and the language comes from the uh, old uh, uh, community of Josephson Junction arrays uh, back 20 years now. Uh, and you realize that you have these such, such case, cages because uh, actually you have interferometers. So if you look at the pattern of phases, you will realize that from one point, you can always find two, po two paths that have the same optical length, so the same number of openings that are self-interfering. And therefore, if you start with a wave packet in some place, you will always get uh, not farther than a couple of, of openings, so you are trapped. So you have localized states. Uh, and indeed, so you see here uh, the, the two cages that are present in the, in the bulk, and they correspond to the two bands. Moreover, the fact that the bands are topological tells also us that there should be some uh, zero energy uh, mid-gap edge states, and that these edge states will have uh, indeed, say, well, okay, so zero is an approximation. As soon as we put this unbalance, they would be exponentially close to zero. Uh, but still, so you see the Hamiltonian, I can rewrite it in this way, and this will be useful in the, in the following. So we will need this rewriting in the following. And let me only stress before going on that um, 
this model has been the workhorse for a lot of uh, other studies uh, of topology, uh, exotic superfluidity, and so on. And if you are wondering about these edge states, also for that, well, there is not, not a measurement yet that I know, but there are proposals how to, to measure it by break, uh, break scattering techniques in, in cold atoms, so it's also verifiable. And now the, 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 the twist, so the, the thing that we want to explore is what happens if we also add Hubbard interaction, okay? So if we add interaction, well, okay, you can think of that as U. I mean, we picked up a strange notation, but that's the standard uh, U. Uh, and that's an interaction for particles sitting on the same physical site with spin up and spin down. Now the, the question is what happens to, to the phase diagram? So along this line of non-interacting, we know that we go from topological to non-topological, but what happens elsewhere? And since uh, then the details might drift us uh, away from, from the whole picture, I prefer to give the whole picture in the beginning and then reanalyze it in, in, in the following. So and the whole picture is, is like that. So to Somehow, to our surprise, we found out that um, not only, well, so you have like a, a transition between the topological insulator and the trivial phase that gets bent and renormalized, but that's kind of standard. Uh, but at some point, if you move instead in the direction of uh, not having Zeeman imbalance or having a very little Zeeman imbalance and you move the interaction strong enough, then you get into another topological trivial phase, but that has uh, a different order character uh, with respect to the one above. So the symbols stay for ferromagnet and paramagnet and topological insulator. It will become clearer in the following. So, uh, and for the, for the ones that are interested in, in uh, the field theory uh, behind this, this model, so we can also predict that this line here uh, is a C equal one line. Uh, so it starts as a C equal one line, which is expected because here it's a, it's a real fermion, it's a full fermion that is getting gapless and then opened again. Um, but at some point it splits. So at the triple point it splits into two C equal one half lines. And uh, this is not only out of numerical evidence, but we have, say, uh, analytical uh, uh, ideas how to justify it. And indeed, the plan, the plan of attack, which is the outline of the following in the talk, is to say, employ analytics and map uh, the, the, the problem onto different Ising models, onto different effective Ising models, in order to, to see that uh, this transition is indeed an Ising transition, as we find numerically, this one as well. And this one is actually not a x, y, but these are, or, or any other uh, U1 transition, but it's uh, uh, two Ising transitions that are sitting on top of each other. They are like uh, going parallel. So, so this C equal one is coming from two C equal one half that sit on top of each other. Um, say that's the analytics, then say, uh, we employ numerics based on matrix product states, as I was promising, and then we do, say, some little bit of entanglement analysis, entanglement spectrum and entanglement entropy analysis. Uh, and then I will come to, the, to the, a scheme uh, how to realize the model or to explore the model in, in experiments. So, okay, so let's get started from, from this side of the phase diagram. So, at zero interaction, we know the picture. Let's see what happens at weak interactions. At weak interactions, the first thing that you want to look at is whether the, um, whether the edge states survive. And to see that, you, simply, you can simply look at the uh, compressibility gap versus the, the uh, degeneracy split. So you can compute the energy to add or remove one particle, or the energy of adding two, three, or, or a, f a few in the thermodynamic limit. So if the, the insulator is a standard insulator, these two quantities should coincide in the thermodynamic limit, and indeed that's what happens here. So different, 
different colors are different sides of the systems. Uh, and say the dashed line is the, um, the degeneracy split versus the, the continuous line is the, is the compressibility gap. And you see that they collapse to the same line. On the other side, in the topological insulator phase, if you do the same, if you perform the same finite size uh, scaling analysis, you will find out that the, 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 uh, the degeneracy split uh, collapses to zero, whereas the compressibility gap stays finite. So the phase is gapped, but there are two degenerate ground states. Uh, no, it's, it's correct. So a little delta goes to zero. And, yeah. um, yep. uh, so that's an indirect, uh, so, or say, that's an energetic way of looking at whether the, the edge states are still there. Um, but we can look at another, another indicator. And the other indicator is, well, we are looking at this transition. It means that we are looking at driving uh, delta epsilon, so Zeeman splitting. So we can look at the uh, observable that is coupled to that, which is the imbalance between the two legs. And if we look at the imbalance between the two legs, uh, we see that this is, say, roughly a magnetization, and it looks very much like uh, an Ising magnetization. So the behavior looks very much like an Ising magnetization. And indeed, if you, if you compute uh, its uh, susceptibility and you scale it, it, it all perfectly nicely fit with uh, Ising. Um, and that was puzzling at the beginning uh, until we realized that, uh, that indeed there is a mapping uh, in which you have to do a little bit of algebra in which you have to do, say, a Bogolyubov transformation followed by a Jordan Wigner one. And this Bogolyubov transformation is mixing the upper and lower leg. So it's a bit non-standard. But if you perform that, you will realize that at zero interaction, you have two perfect copies, independent copies of an Ising model. Okay, and that's justifying the fact that the magnetization here is, is looking like the one of an Ising. Uh, and it's also justifying the following fact that, that it will be C equal one. Okay? And as soon as you put interactions, the coupling between these two Ising models is magnetization to magnetization. And then you can try to do self-consistent mean field uh, and get, say, perturbatively some, some expression for the transition line, and that's the red line here, and it fits very nicely with, with the data. Okay, but uh, then you can think, okay, this will be a line, and then it quantitatively deviates from self-consistent in field, but it's like kind of boring. It will extend up to infinite and, and uh, finished. Actually not, because, uh, say, or, uh, at the beginning, you can have this impression because you go to strong interactions, and at very strong interactions, you can also do, um, say, an effective model. It's kind of a standard machinery, so you project on the singly occupied rungs because you have a very strong interaction, so you don't want to have two particles sitting on the same side, right? So you have only one particle per side, and then you have the degree of freedom of being in the upper leg or in the lower leg. And this you can describe it as, as a spin, one half, right? So if you do that and you compute the super exchange coupling, which is the same thing that you do in the upper model to get out uh, uh, antiferromagnetism, uh, you will get uh, an effective Ising model described by these uh, um, spin one half operators that are called T. Uh, and you realize that Tz is the same that we were using before. So it's the number of particles in the upper leg minus the number of particles in the lower leg. So it's the one that you intuitively would call uh, Z spin. And Y is the proper, the proper uh, conjugate uh, thing. So uh, the effective model looks like that. And indeed, if you look at the proper observables here, uh, so at the susceptibility of the magnetization uh, in Z direction, you get again a, a nice uh, Ising scaling. If you look at the 
uh, y, uh, so at the peak of the structure factor of the yy correlations, you get like an order parameter that is nicely scaling to finite on one side and, and zero on the other, describing this transition. So here, then, so at very strong interaction, we have a transition from something into something where one phase is ferromagnetic in this language and the other one is paramagnetic. And now, at first sight, you will think, okay, that's only the continuation of that line. But then you realize, oh, here I have a singleizing model, right? So I have C equal one half, so something else should happen somewhere else. And moreover, uh, this something else should happen some here in the middle, because if you compute the, the order parameter for, uh, for this phase here, so this TY, TY correlations, uh, and you compute it deep in the, in the topological insulator, this is zero, okay? So again, there should be another transition here between these two, okay? Uh, so in order to see which kind of transition, now we need this language of the, of the uh, cages, right? So we mentioned at the beginning we can write the Hamiltonian either in the real space basis with where the creation and annihilation operators are, are the one creating and annihilating fermions on single sites, but we can also change unitarily the basis to the one of uh, Aronov bomb cages. They are also a localized base, so you can redepict the thing as a ladder where now the sites are lowest cage, upper cage, so lowest band, upper band. And if you work out the, the mathematics, you will realize that in this language, you get an, uh, an extended and quite exotic Hubbard model. So you get like nearest neighbor interaction, pair, pair tunneling, density assisted tunneling, a lot of other, uh, say, terms that people are usually uh, looking for without, uh, so with, with uh, long range interactions and so on, but here you get them for free. Um, and a crucial disclaimer or say a crucial annotation for the, for the ones interested in similar calculations, we are keeping both bands at the difference with, with uh, most of the literature, so we are not doing a projection on the lowest band because otherwise you miss the symmetry of the, of the transition actually. Okay, so and something that I will not talk about, but if you are interested, you can look it up in the, in the paper, is that in terms of this, uh, of this uh, extended upper model, you can also reformulate the full, the full description of the phase diagram in terms of a uh, Fano Anderson problem, so of an impurity problem where your edge states are the impurities and, and they decouple, in, in, so they couple into the, the, the bulk and get hybridized and get washed out. Um, okay, so at weak imbalance, indeed, so um, we can uh, now define again an either Ising model where now we are restricting to the single, singly uh, Aronov bomb cage uh, uh, manifold. So, so you are restricting to the fact that either you are populating the lowest band or the upper band for each of the models. Uh, and you derive an effective model that looks like that, that is again an Ising model where, okay, now the, 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 the thing that is uh, uh, nearest neighbor interacting is Tx, and there is another Tz. And this T, T tilde Z is now written in terms of the cages, okay? So it's not anymore written in terms of the local. So the interpretation is a bit complicated, but it should be uh, very much related to the current that is circulating around the plaquette. So either it's, it's going, say, uh, clockwise or anti-clockwise, roughly speaking, okay? And again, you have a singleizing model. You get a singleizing model. You can predict uh, from, from that where the transition should be, and that's actually where, where you also find it numerically, uh, at this interaction over uh, tunneling equal to eight. And again, here you see that the, the thing is fitting nicely. And now, one interesting annotation is that uh, 
if you would perform a Jordan Wigner transformation on, on this Ising model, you would get for the Bogolyubov uh, modes some effective bands, which are now not anymore free fermions in the original language, because here you have interactions and so on. It's some, some complicated mapping and remapping. But you get some effective bands that are also starting flat, getting bent down, touching Dirac-like, and reopening trivial. But this time, they are, say, these effective bands are flat in the strong interaction regime, and they are getting trivial the other way around. But there are like a lot of non-local mapping, so there, there is no contradiction in that. But it's, it's uh, still interesting to see that, that you have, say, kind of the same picture of flat bands getting uh, deformed and touching and so on, dual between the two. And it's some, actually something that we would like to, to understand better. And in particular, we would like to understand better, so uh, feedbacks are welcome if somebody has ideas. Uh, what exactly is happening here at the triple point and why this line is so seems very fine tuned for a lot of uh, for a wide range of interactions and then at some point it departs uh, well okay that's what I was mentioning before about the impurity model in a nutshell uh, if you would write the impurity model which we have not done here uh, you will connect it to the topological character in the sense that um, you will get edge-edge interactions mediated by the bulk. And this will shift energies, but not lift the degeneracy. But you can also look at the imaginary part of the, of the coupling and look at dephasing. And uh, you will get dephasing as soon as these Bogolyubov modes get gapped, uh, so uh, as soon as they get gapless, which means as soon as these strange, uh, very curious effective bands are touching each other, okay? And this again explains this transition here in terms of the edge modes get washed out, yes. Um, okay, and then the numerics, most of the numerics that you have seen uh, that was complementing the, the, the analytics, uh, was done by matrix product states. I guess that you all know this, this concept of uh, having a, a many body Hilbert space that is extremely expensive, but uh, thanks to the area law, uh, actually the, the picture is not so dramatic, so the, the physically accessible states are a very tiny corner, and therefore you can do a, a economic, uh, say quite cheap, uh, description of, of your many body states by, uh, by tensor network decompositions. And uh, most famous is the variational uh, DMRG approach, but there are several others. Uh, and there are plenty of different decomposition in tensor products, but uh, that's something that does not affect us here too much. Uh, but what can we read out of these uh, matrix state simulations? Well, naturally, we have access to the entanglement uh, spectrum and to the entanglement entropy in particular, which is, uh, roughly speaking, you bipartite your system in, in two parts, and then you look at the, um, the entropy of the reduced density matrix of one, half, of one, one part of the, of the system. And uh, according to, to uh, conformal field theories uh, studies, you can connect directly uh, the way this uh, uh, entropy scales with the size of your, of your block with the so-called central charge. And here you neatly see, uh, I hope that the colors are visible. So these are three sample points, but we have done it for all the points that are depicted here uh, along the transition lines that along this line here, that we were predicting two coupled Ising models and therefore twice uh, one half, so central charge equal one, you get this blue scaling here, okay? Uh, and the only fitting parameter there is simply this non-universal part, this non-universal shift, okay? Uh, while if you look at these other transitions, so to the topological to ferromagnet or to the ferromagnet to paramagnet, you will get these other two lines, okay? 
And indeed, they are, say, same slope, but different non-universal part, but that doesn't matter. OK, but actually, you can get out more. And what, what is that more that you can get out is the full entanglement spectrum. And you can look at the lowest part of the entanglement spectrum, say, log of these uh, uh, eigenvalues. And uh, you realize that in the topological insulator phase, so these are random uh, points in, inside the, the three phases, that in the topological insulator phase, you will, you will have a tower that is always doubly degenerate in your, in your entanglement uh, uh, levels, whereas uh, in the paramagnet and in the ferromagnet, you get, say, not specific uh, uh, patterns of degeneration. And this is an indication that this phase, which is known to be, say, uh, a symmetry-protected topological phase at zero interaction, is somehow robust also to interactions. Uh, in, so that you can extend the usual paradigm of looking at the entanglement spectrum also there. Uh, so it, 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 together with the presence of the edge states that we measured by energy and so on, it's all indications that this is a topological uh, phase overall. OK, and I guess that I have one minute or even less. Uh, so let me only flesh the experimental ingredients. And um, the idea is to use a lot of, of the ingredients that probably Fabrice have introdu has introduced last week, uh, which is so uh, use, say, a state-independent uh, gradient in order to suppress the spontaneous tunneling in your optical lattice. And, and then we want to use a, a weakly spin-dependent uh, optical lattice in addition that, is, that gets modulated in time. And by doing that, you can, uh, well, uh, you can work out the fact that the, your effective tunneling matrix will, will get a, a Bessel function, and not only a Bessel function, but if you play enough with the phases of this shaking, you will also get phases. So you will realize the uh, plus i for the upper leg and the minus i for the lower leg. And on the other side, you want also the spin flips. But the spin flips, you can get them by standard, with quote marks, uh, Raman-assisted tunneling, only with three different frequencies that are properly tuned. And here it's a spot for an old paper of ours with another possible implementation that does not rely on shaking, but only on energy selection rules. But uh, forget about that for the moment. Uh, we can discuss details. And so this is the overall picture and, and perspective. So overall, we have found, say, this, we have explored this, this model, uh, which is a traditional workhorse uh, for uh, uh, one-dimensional or quasi-one-dimensional topological phases. And we have found that uh, under interactions, you get a splitting of a, of a Dirac line, so-called Dirac line C equal 1 into two Majorana ones. Um, we have not yet explored what does it mean for the topological excitation, so whether we are mistaken and somehow the phase down there that we are calling ferromagnet is somehow instead also still having some kind of fractional topological excitation. Um, then we have, uh, I did not present it, but we have done, so we can look it up, uh, mappings onto impurity problems and broadening of edge modes and so on. So you have a new twist to uh, understand the topological transitions. Uh, well, we think that we have high feasibility and detectability in, in current or, say, next future experimental setup. So I hope that somebody will realize it. And there are a number of questions about what happens if we have now non-perfect flux, so if you don't have pi, so if you don't have uh, perfectly flat, uh, flat bands, and what happens away from all filling, because all of that was exactly at all filling, but then as soon as you go to fractional fillings, then a lot of other things can happen, say uh, emergent symmetries, fractional effects, and, and so on. And I leave you with uh, a, a a list of other recent works that are related somehow to exploring to the same kind of red line, which is exploring uh, 
topological or interesting phases with ultra cold atoms uh, by a gauge fields and so on. And I thank you for your attention. And I forgot to put the, the banner with thank you for your attention, but still. <laughs>